Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 297 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the Beast of Gévaudan. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. In 1764, a reign of terror began in the Gévaudan region of France. A strange, unknown animal began attacking and killing human beings. The beast's reign of terror ended three years later in 1767. And according to some estimates, it attacked more than 200 people. It killed more than a hundred of them. What made the beast so ferocious? Why did it attack and kill so many people? And can we identify what it was? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Jimmy, what do we need to say to begin this week's mystery? This week's mystery is a cryptid hunt, a search for an unknown or hidden animal, at least an animal that was unknown or hidden to people at the time. However, in this case, we're dealing with a cryptid that is a predator, and it's a predator that attacks human beings. This means that it did things that could make some listeners squeamish. However, as always on Mysterious World, we will be keeping things as clinical as possible. This means that we won't be dwelling on the gruesome, gory aspects of of its attacks. However, in order to figure out what the beast was, we can't avoid them entirely. We will be keeping those elements to a minimum, and we will be saving them as late in the episode as possible so that we don't have to return to discussing them. So we only have to bring them up once. Uh, But particularly sensitive listeners and parents of particularly sensitive children should be aware that we will be mentioning them as briefly and lightly as possible. For the large majority of listeners, though, this shouldn't be an issue. But for some listeners, it might be more significant. Let's talk about the setting of today's mystery. The Gévaudan region is a mountainous area in southern France, but what was going on in this time period? Well, the king at the time was Louis XV, known as the Beloved. He was the son of Louis XIV, who was known as the Sun King, and he was the grandfather of Louis XVI, the final king of France before the Revolution. Louis XVI was also the husband of Marie Antoinette, who we discussed in episode 244 on the Versailles time slip. And Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette were sent to the guillotine after the French Revolution, but those unhappy times were still almost 30 years in the future from today's mystery. And so today, we're back in the time of Louis XVI's grandfather, Louis XV. In in 1764, France also was just coming out of a major war. The Seven Years' War had ended the previous year in 1763, And its name does not give away just how big a war it was. In truth, the Seven Years' War was actually a world war. They didn't have a term back then, but it was a global conflict that involved most of the major European powers. It was not, however, confined to Europe. In addition to the fighting that went on there, there were also theaters of conflict here in the Americas, in the Caribbean, in Asia, and in the Pacific. So it was really massive. They just didn't have the World War numbering system in place yet, or it would be numbered as one of those. Finally, Europe was in the grip of the Little Ice Age at the time. It had begun in the 1300s, and it wouldn't end until the next century in the 1800s. So things were cold in Gévaudan, particularly in the winters. And what time of year does the mystery begin? Well, we're not entirely sure, but it looks like it was in the spring. The first recorded attack has been estimated to have occurred in April of 1764, and it involved a woman whose name unfortunately has been lost. In his book, The Gévaudan Tragedy, uh, Carl Hans Take describes the encounter this way. A girl or woman whose name is unknown was guarding cattle with dogs on a forest pasture and was attacked by a carnivore that suddenly appeared. 
The victim of the attack described the animal to be as big as a cow with dense hair and long claws. The animal had a very wide chest, a big head, short upright ears, and a long snout. The tail was long and strangely thin. From the upper side of the head to the tip of the tail ran a dark stripe. The dogs fled, but the cattle formed a defensive wall within which the shepherdess found protection. The beast tried to break through this wall, concentrating its attack exclusively on its human victim. The clothing of the shepherdess was torn, but she remained uninjured. So this attack did not result in there being a casualty. Beast zero, bovine defenders one. Go bovine defenders. And this is something that some breeds of cattle had been known to do. They will form defensive barriers and rings to protect their own herd members, as well as their offspring and even their human caretakers. This encounter also gave us our first physical description of the beast. It was as big as a cow. Given the size of cattle at the time, that would suggest it was around 4 feet 6 inches tall. And if it was as densely bodied as a cow, it would have weighed as much as 1,600 pounds, though that's probably too high for a carnivore. It also had dense hair and long claws. It had a wide chest, a big head, short upright ears, and a long snout. The first recorded attack where the beast took a human life was a few months later on June 30th, when a young woman named Jeanne Boulet was tending her cattle. Only the cattle didn't manage to successfully defend her, and her burial certificate stated that she had been killed by the ferocious beast. Not a ferocious beast, but the ferocious beast, indicating that whatever killed her already had a reputation, and there may well have been other attacks that were known to the people of the area, but records of them have not survived. Now, we're not going to walk through all of the beasts recorded encounters with people. There are other resources that take a more encounter-by-encounter approach, and we'll have links to a couple of books so that you can read that kind of description if you want that. But there are just too many accounts for us to go through that way here, and frankly, they're just too bloody for a family show. So I read them so you don't have to. What we're going to do instead is look at three particular encounters that don't involve anyone dying on screen, just to give you a sense of what a beast attack could be like. And then we'll back out and give you a top-level summary of the findings, including how many beast attacks there were in total, and how the overall course of the French authorities' fight against the beast proceeded. So here's the first account I mentioned. It's a dramatized account, and it comes from the Gustavo Romero and S.R. Schwalb book, Beast, Werewolves, Serial Killers, and Man-Eaters, The Mystery of the Monsters of Gévaudan. It, this encounter occurred in January of 1765. It involved seven children who were tending their livestock, which was common for children to do at the time. And there's even a famous illustration of the seven children fighting the beast. Romero and Schwal write, It was January 12, 1765. Seven children from the parish of Chanelay in Le Villeray, the Gévaudan, France, were watching their family's cattle on a local mountainside. Keep your car away from the bog, Panaflu, shouted Jacques Potefay as he dueled with Jacques Couston and Jean Pic. Potefay, Couston, and Pic were the same age, 12. Each wielded a long stick topped with a triangular iron point covered by a sheath. Watch it, said eight-year-old Jean Verrier, collecting firewood. You almost hit me. It's very cold today, complained Joseph Penaflu, also eight. At Portefeuille's bidding, Penaflu guided his cow away from the marshy area nearby. He snuggled up to its thick winter coat and closed his eyes, shivering. The cow flapped its ears. Ha! exclaimed Madeleine Chauss, age nine, said her friend Jean Giffier. It's only January, Penaflu. Winter has barely begun. The cattle, hardy sailor's stock, grazed outside year-round. Today they nibbled on snow-dusted grass. Penaflu stroked to the cow's side. He felt the sun come and go on his face as it flashed beneath speeding clouds in the hard blue sky. The cow snorted. Penaflu opened his eyes. 
The big boys were still dueling. Verrier was stacking his wood. The girls were singing. And through the leafless trees, Penaflu saw a monster loping up the mountain trail toward them. Penaflu's jaw dropped. He slid down onto the snow, clinging to the cow's leg. The other children laughed. What are you doing, Penaflu? Sitting in fresh manure? That'll warm you up. Or are you after warm milk? That's not where her teats are. Penaflu did not answer. Jacques Potafay sees dueling. He eyed the little boy and followed his gaze. A four-footed demon was nearly upon them. The beast, Potafay breathed, staring through his own frosty breath. The beast, he bellowed. He dashed to Joseph and hauled the youngster to his feet. Everyone, here, now! He pulled the sheath from the end of his pike and made the sign of the cross. Madeline, Jean, Verrier, Penaflu, behind, Couston, Peak, with me. But the beast had already arrived. She prowled about the little troop, leering. The beast of the Gévaudan was the size of a one-year-old calf. Her fur was reddish. She had a black stripe along her back and a long tail. And fangs. She's ugly, Jean whispered. She smells, added Madeleine. The beast salivated. Circle, shouted Portefey. Turn with her. He shoved his companions. Keep her in front of us. The cattle stamped their feet and lowed. The cows will protect us, Joseph cried. Hide among them. He bolted for the herd. The beast leapt. In one fluid motion, she caught little Penaflu by the throat. Portefey marveled. How easy it is for her. The children gaped. Come on, Portefey yelled. As if awakened from some trance, the youngsters moved, thrusting primitive spears. Harder, said Portefey. They stabbed, shrieking. The beast, disoriented, released Penaflu. Madeline dragged Penaflu away and held him. The beast's eyes snapped. It rushed again. The girl screamed. Stay together, shouted Portefey. Circle. The beast lunged into eight-year-old Jean Verrier who fell. It drew back, then lunged again. The older children advanced. Still, the beast struck, dragging Jean away by his arm. Couston wailed, We must get help! No, roared Portefey. We rescue Jean, or perish with him. Pick, go left. I'll go right. Drive it into the bog, everyone! They all followed Portefey. Even the cattle moved toward the creature, tossing their horns. Distracted, the beast stumbled into the swamp with very air and struggled in the freezing water. The children caught up. Charge, commanded Portefey. Monster, shouted Couston. Demon, said Madeline. Yelling for all they were worth, the boys and girls of the parish of Chandelay surrounded the famous beast of the Gévaudan. Attack her head, her eyes, her jaws, advised Portefey. They stabbed at the creature over and over again. It seemed like forever, when in fact the entire encounter lasted mere minutes. The beast was unable to kill or even bite little Jean. She was too busy snapping at the primitive pikes and dodging blows. Once, she seized Portefeuille's iron tip and bent it. Finally, the beast dropped Verrier and drew back. Portefeuille scrambled down to help the boy. The beast freed itself from the bog, shaking the wet from her fur like a dog. She turned to study her attackers from atop a mound. We have her now, said Portefeuille. The seven clenched spears. But the beast had had enough of the youngsters of Le Villeray. She darted into the forest. She's gone, said Madeline. Children! The children wheeled. An adult had arrived at last. The courage of seven children rallied king, court, and people and provided the young hero Portefey with an all-expenses-paid education and a career in the military. So this encounter with the beast ended well. The seven children and the cows managed to fight it off. Now, here's the second account I mentioned, which didn't turn out quite as well. It occurred on Wednesday, March 13th, 1765, and it occurred to a woman named Jean Jouvet. Romero and Schwal write, Jean, the farm, woman or wife, Jove, spouse of tenant farmer Pierre, was in the garden beside their house in La Bessière, France, parish of Saint-Alban, with three of her six children. Jean's daughter was holding her youngest child, a baby boy, and singing to him. Her six-year-old son, meanwhile, was playing with a stick, poking it into the receding snow and mud beneath in the shade of the garden wall. The late winter sun felt good on Jean's face, and the fresh air was invigorating, but a glance at the forest beyond confirmed. 
The trees were not yet ready to leaf out. Spring was still a long way away. The six-year-old bent down to pat the mud with a small hand. Jean sighed, no, no. An unexpected breeze made her shiver. The slender mother drew her shawl around her. It's too cold to stay out, children. Let's go inside. She reached down, taking the stick from the boy. Then, from the corner of her eye, she saw a stone falling from the wall. And something else. An animal plummeting from the top. A brute. A monster. It was like a wolf, but not a wolf. Large. Reddish. Its coat was scarred, diseased. Jean froze, gripping her shawl. The brute landed, splattering snow and mud, lashing its tail, appraising the stunned mother and her brood. The beast, Jean whispered. She began to shudder. In our garden, our lady protect us. And then it pounced. Jean watched in horror as it struck her daughter, grabbing an arm. The impact caused the girl and her baby brother to fall to the ground. Her daughter cried out, but managed to hold on to the babe. Jean fell upon the beast, flailing it with her son's little stick. Let them go, she screamed. The stick broke. The beast growled and clawed at Jean's arm and head. She fought back, punching it. Let them go! Her daughter gave it a kick. The beast roared, slamming all three against the wall. Jean's face scraped against rough stone. Her daughter shrieked. The baby cried. Weeping, herself in pain and fear and anger, the mother shielded the pair with her body. Mama! Jean groaned. Her son. Her six-year-old boy. The beast whirled to face the child who'd been left alone lunged forward, wrapped its jaws around its new quarry, and shook. Something within Jean snapped. Take the baby to the house, she screamed at her daughter. As the girl darted off, Jean rose, hands curled to fists, and scrambled, slipping on snow and mud to the beast. She shoved it over, freeing her son. There. But the beast got to its feet instantly and went for the boy again. Mama! I'm here, shouted Jean. This time she leapt upon the monster's back, anything to distract it. Pulling its head backward to her chest, she screamed, leave us alone. The beast collapsed. Jean tumbled off, grasping for her son. The beast snarled, breathing in her face. The smell. Woman and beast were eye to eye, panting. Its eyes are as fiery as they say, Jean thought, as if from somewhere far away. Without warning, the beast swiped at her again. Oh, cried Jean, clapping her hands to her head. The beast took her son again and this time leapt up and over the wall, carrying the youngster away. No. Shaking, Jean got to her feet once more. She picked up the fallen stone and went after them. She ran around to the gate as quickly as she could and left the garden. Beast and boy were ahead. The beast was strong, but the weight of the boy slowed its progress. Heart pounding, Jean rushed and, unbelievably, caught up with them. And then she grabbed the creature's tail. Some accounts said she grabbed a foot. Some, that she sees the beast in the places she judged to be the most sensitive. So that means she grabbed it by its genitals, so it was a male. The beast dropped the boy and gave a cry, spinning toward John. She let go of its tail and smacked it on the head with a stone. Take that. The beast, mad with pain, clawed her once more. Jean faltered. Retrieving its prey, the creature made for a hole in a hedge before them, evidently striving for the open fields beyond. Jean pushed herself again, this time grasping for her son's feet, dragging along on the ground. I can't reach him. Her six-year-old was silent now. Help, help, Jean cried in despair. Mother! Jean started. Her two older sons appeared. They'd been moving the family's flock of sheep. And there was their dog. Weak now, the woman pointed to the departing beast. The beast, your brother! The dog was already making for the beast, barking furiously. It threw the beast to the ground. The six-year-old fell to one side. Enraged, the beast twirled and body slammed the dog, throwing it head over heels several yards. Jean's older son rushed to his mother. The other son, brandishing a spear, joined the dog in combat and stabbed the beast on its haunches. The beast bailed, streaking away. The blood-soaked Jean flung her stone after it and went to her injured son. So that's a dramatized account of what happened to Jean Jouvet and her heroic efforts to defend her children against the beast. Unfortunately, the beast had done so much damage to her young son that he died three days later. But Jean's efforts made her a heroine all over France, and the king awarded her 300 livres, or pounds, for her bravery. That's something like $2,400 after all the inflation the governments have caused. Now, here's the third story, which has a happier ending. 
It occurred a few months later in August of 1765, and the woman at the center of the story was named Marie-Jean Vallée. There's also a famous illustration of this encounter. According to Romero and Schwalb, On August 11, 1765, mid to late morning, a young woman named Marie-Jean Vallée, 19 or 20 years old, a servant of the curate, or clergyman, of the parish of Pouillon, and her sister Thérèse, 16 or 17, were crossing the river de Gé on their way to the community's tithe farm. Local peasants contributed a tithe, or one-tenth of their output, for the support of the local church and cleric. It was kept in a tithe barn. The beast, lurking in the underbrush along the river banks, spotted the girls and flung itself at Marie-Jean. Luckily, the sensible young woman had brought along a spear, a stick with a bayonet sharp on both sides, about half a foot long and an inch and a half wide. She used it. Marie-Jean Vallée impaled the beast with her weapon, actually knocking it down, all the while yelling for help along with her sister. According to the accounts and letters presented by Pouchet, the beast retreated, cried out very loudly, and held her paw in front of the wound, then threw herself in the river, where she rolled over several times before disappearing. Later, when questioned by authorities, the girls, their testimony translated into French by Trophine Lafont, described the beast as being the size of a large farm dog. It was gray with a white chest and black back, they said. Its front was bigger than its rear. It had a big flat head and big teeth. The authorities examined Marie-Jean's spear and noted that the shaft of the weapon was coated in two or three inches of blood. The intrepid Jean-Marie was an Amazon, according to the local press. Royal gunbearer Francois Antoine, impressed with her bravery and composure, called her a second maid of Orléans, a second Joan of Arc. Marie-Jean Vallée now has a sculpture commemorating her valor in a windswept churchyard in Auvers, France. In fact, we used a silhouette of Marie-Jean battling the beast in the cover art for today's episode. And now we've covered the three dramatized incidents, so we're going to step back or up and look at the mystery from a kind of top-level perspective. Then let's start with the overall numbers. How long was the beast's reign of terror and how many people did it attack? Since we don't know precisely when the beast attacks began, we can't give an exact figure on how long it lasted, but it appears to have been somewhat over three years, from 1764 to 1767. In that time, it attacked and killed many dozens of people. Sources differ on exactly how many, and no doubt that's partly because it was hard at the time for people to separate attacks by the beast from attacks by other beasts. So all we can really expect are estimates. But according to one recent estimate that was made by looking at early sources, the beast attacked at least 210 people in the three-year period, and it managed to kill 113 of those 200, so about half. It further managed to injure another 49 of the 200, or a quarter of them. However, these numbers are likely incomplete. It was, by any measure, an extraordinarily aggressive creature towards humans. It attacked children and teenagers and adult women. Its least favorite target was adult men, which is what you might expect, as men are generally larger and more dangerous and can thus make more difficult prey. What's weird is that the beast did not really seem interested in attacking other animals, such as livestock, like cows, sheep, or goats. It went after humans in particular, which is odd because livestock, especially sheep, are much easier targets for predators than humans are. That's why wolves tend to be shy about humans but have no problem attacking sheep. How did the authorities respond when the beast began its attacks? They did several things. One of them was that they temporarily allowed ordinary people to have guns. At the time, there were laws that restricted the ownership of firearms to members of the nobility. But with the beast on the loose, they realized that ordinary people needed better weapons to defend themselves, and so they authorized a temporary measure allowing normal people to have firearms. 
They also put a price on the beast's head to encourage people to hunt and kill it. At the time, for killing a wolf, you got a bounty of six livres, or about $50 today. But for killing the beast, you'd get a bounty of 200 livres, or about $1,600 today. Though it's hard to make monetary comparisons over such a long period of time, and it's worth noting that 200 livres was considered a year's wage for a day laborer. At the current minimum wage of $7.25 an hour in the United States and 2,080 hours in a 40-hour work week, that would be the equivalent of $15,000 today. So there's, there's different ways of estimating how much a livre would be worth today. But whatever the value of the reward, people started hunting the beast. To cite just one example... On October 8, 1764... Hours after mauling Jean Rieteau, the beast was observed in the grounds of Chateau de la Baume, eyeing another young herdsman. Hunters trailed the animal into the estate's woods. Forced from its cover by dozens of beaters, peasant assistants tasked with beating through the brushwood with various implements, shouting, making noise, and in general, creating an uproar to drive terrified game out into the open. It worked. The beast was spotted and had at last become prey itself and so its hunters took aim, fired, and hit their target. But to their astonishment, the animal fell, only to rise and run on. Another shot, and again success. The creature dropped. But through the thick white smoke of gunpowder, they witnessed the same phenomenon. The beast scrambled to its feet and took off. The hunters pursued it until nightfall, anxious to finish off the wounded animal, and resumed the next morning pre-dawn. Two hundred men scoured the woods of Chateau de la Bon, hoping to find a deceased beast. It was not to be. This was just one beast hunt of many, though, according to Romero and Schwalb. A total of nearly 50 official hunts would ensue from November 15, 1764. France's controller general, Le Verdi, recommended that peasants assist on Sundays and holidays. Traditionally, days set aside for worship, rest, and celebration— Sundays and holiday feast days were now commandeered for hunting for two reasons. One, more people would be available. Two, as they were not work days, the local economy would be less disrupted. Meanwhile, winter was setting in. And the media was beginning to take notice. It's true. The time of the beast was also the time of a growing commerce in news, information, human interest stories, and advertising. Understandably, the calamities caused by the creature in the Gévaudan began to attract the attention of fledgling print media in the region, in Paris, in Europe, and even across the Atlantic. At that time, media consumption was, well, social. A single copy of a newspaper, news sheet, or a popular press broadsheet or broadside, one-page publications featuring news stories, ballads, prayers, or advertising, was often circulated to many people. This was done in numerous ways, by subscription, via rental from news vendors, by being read aloud in cafes and other gathering spots, or through individual perusal in reading rooms. Primary news outlets at the time included the Courrier d'Avignon of Avignon, France, the closest major newspaper to the Gévaudan region, and perhaps one of the most inaccurate, according to sources. Its normal circulation might be as much as 1,000. At the time of the beast, Print runs were increased to 3,000. And by now, the different rewards for the beast from different sources added up to 4,000 livres. As a result of all the publicity the beast was receiving, people started to send in ideas about how to catch it, and some of the ideas were really out there. Well-intentioned people and those hoping for reward money proposed a wide-ranging assortment of ideas and contrivances for the capture of the beast. A Mr. Joas de Papu wrote to officials in February of 1765 to suggest the counterfeiting of women. To this end, seeing that the monster is ravenous for females, it is only necessary to place in the places where it appears artificial females, composed of the most subtle poison, and expose them on flexible posts on the various roads to invite the cursed animal to show its unbridled fury and swallow its own end. Three expanded pig bladders seasoned with poison, would make up a woman's head and breasts. A painted face would be affixed. Monsieur de Papou wrote again in ten weeks with another plan, 
this one involving 25 intrepid men dressed in assorted animal skins and feathers with headgear trimmed in feathers and small knife edges. Everything should be coated in honey and fragrant with musk. Then the hunter should combine 12 ounces of human fat from a Christian with viper's blood, if available. The asp viper is found throughout much of France and distribute to the parties in boxes. The men should be armed with urson pistols and three square bullets, bitten by the teeth of a woman or girl, then joined with pieces of iron and also covered in fat, plus hunting knives and iron claws, also greased. They should patrol three by three in silence in a large triangle. A single one of them could be the vanquisher of the cruel beast. Another plan proposed by Monsieur Herbert of Vernier, France, was to dress a sheep like a little girl, fasten a bonnet on its head, and tie it out. Note that it is best to arrange that the sheep is upright and of about the same size as a child. Children fashioned from straw could be placed by the sheep. Marksmen were to lie in wait nearby. He also suggested having children cavort before another contingent of hidden marksmen. A curate from Reims, who thought the beast was a tiger cat from Mexico, directed officials to grease the backs of veal calves with poison and surround them with traps, luring the beast to its doom. A lieutenant colonel, Du Parquet, advised that the beast's hunters should switch to steel musket balls since the beast, rumored to be covered in scales, was impervious to lead. Monsieur Lespinas de Mongebeau, proposed an infallible wooden machine on a 25-foot track to take the creature alive for the king. A model of a child would be inside as bait while, in a tree nearby, someone would cry and lament all day and even more at night to attract the beast. Some of these ideas were quite impractical, like making artificial women that didn't move like women or smell like women or taste like women— a beast was hardly like to attack such mannequins and eat enough to poison itself. Other ideas were quite dangerous, like having children cavort and play in the open to attract the beast so marksmen can shoot it. It's claimed that back in the old days here in America, in places like Florida, they would have children out on a river or stream, and when an alligator went for one of the children, the adults would attack it. So such children were referred to as gator bait. There's debate about whether such things really happened, but here we have a proposal to use children as beast bait. However, one thing they did do was to try to kill the beast using poison. That actually was a tactic that was used against wolves that were eating livestock. For example, they'd take the carcass of a sheep, poison it, and le then leave it out for wolves or other predators to eat. Well, they adapted that technique in this case. And this is super gross, so I'm going to say it very briefly and delicately. But the people were desperate to stop the beast from killing any more humans. So they actually poisoned the bodies of some of the victims, but the beast never returned to them. And so the beast never got poisoned so far as we know. Did they ever try bringing professional hunters in to deal with the beast? Actually, yes. In fact, over time, they brought in several different professionals. Newspapers like the Avignon Courier mocked King Louis for not being able to deal with a simple animal, and so did the newspapers in England. So the king sent in several different professionals to deal with the beast, but they weren't having a lot of luck, and so they periodically got supplemented or replaced. Then, in September of 1765, one of the professionals, a man named Francois Antoine, killed a large animal that was believed to be the beast. This animal was destroyed in Auvergne rather than Gévaudan. In fact, it was killed near a place called Chaz, and so it became known as Le Loup de Chaz, or the Wolf of Chaz. After Antoine bagged it, they did taxidermy on the creature, and it was displayed at King Louis's court in Versailles, which we talked about back in episode 244 on the Versailles time slip. An autopsy was done on the animal, and it was uncommonly large, so people were hopeful that the terrible beast of Gévaudan had finally been killed. And for a while, it looked like that was the case. Seventy-two days went by without any new attacks in the region. But then the beast struck again, 
at the beginning of December of 1765, and it kept attacking into the new year. Unfortunately, at this point, King Louis didn't want to hear about it. His attitude was, hey, my royal gun bearer, Antoine, has already killed this thing. There is no more beast of Gévaudan. Also at this point, the newspapers kind of stopped carrying reports of the beast attacks, perhaps to avoid the royal displeasure. But that didn't help ordinary people because they were still under threat from the thing. And the attacks would go on until June of 1767, almost two years from the time the wolf of Shaz was killed. But then another animal was killed by a hunter named Jean Chastel. Here's Romero and Schwalb's dramatized account of what happened. Jean Chastel had moved away from the others, who were now crashing through the underbrush, some distance from him, startling wildlife, searching for the enemy. The dawn had come and gone, and he had not yet paid his respects to Our Lady. He stopped at the Song, Marsh, Dover, placed his gun against a tree, and retrieved his spectacles and prayer book from his pockets. The sun, still cloaked in a misty gauze, shone down through the trees. Chastel prayed. The wind muttered among the pines. A twig snapped. Chastel calmly looked up from his book. There, through the pines, was one of the Marquis's dogs coming toward him in hot pursuit of the beast. In a spirit of piety and confidence, Chastel finished his prayers and slipped his book and spectacles into a waistcoat pocket. The monster turned, to the dog's surprise, and lunged at the canine, snapping, savagely biting its nose and face. The dog howled, blood running into his eyes. Chastel took up his gun. The beast proceeded on its course, moving fast, winding through the trees. Then it saw Chastel. It slid to a stop. Chastel did not move. Man and menace faced one another. Chastel ticked off all the characteristics of the beast. The immense size the odd coloring, the blazing orbs. Like a wolf and yet not a wolf. He fired. Bam! The shot echoed through the woods of Tenezer. It was good. The beast shuddered as if something possessed it. It stumbled, got up, stumbled again. Chastel waited as the chalky gun smoke cleared. The beast fell. It did not get up again. Sides heaving, fighting for its breath. It focused on Chastel with a savage look. Then the hunter watched as the embers of its eyes faded and went out at last. Beast, said Chastel softly, thou wilt eat no more. A griffin vulture, Jeeps of Fulvis, circling above, gave a raspy cry. This animal was killed in the Tenazer woods, and it was a canid, a wolf-like or dog-like creature, so it's known as the Tenazer canid. Exactly what happened to its remains afterwards is something of a mystery. There was an autopsy on it, just as there had been for the Wolf of Shaz. But after this was done, there are different accounts of what happened next. According to one account, it was taken to Versailles and shown to King Louis. And according to another account, it was taken to Paris. What both accounts agree on, though, is that it smelled really bad. So any taxidermy that had been done on it was done improperly, and they didn't keep the body around long. However, this time, unlike the Wolf of Shaz, the attacks really did stop, and the people were much relieved. So now we can look at the Beast of Gévaudan from the perspectives of faith and reason. And before we get to those perspectives, we want to take a moment here to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Mark P., Emerson W., Donna P., Robert G., and Martin W. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Yakin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by DeliverContacts.com, offering top brand contact lenses at always low prices with free delivery. Visit DeliverContacts.com and by The Grady Group, a Catholic company bringing financial clarity to their clients across the United States, using safe money options to produce reasonable rates of return for their clients. Learn more at GradyGroupInc.com. 
So, Jimmy, what theories do we need to consider about the Beast of Gévaudan? Well, there are more than you might expect. Uh, for a start, there are some theories that explain the Beast of Gévaudan in human terms. In other words, it wasn't an animal that attacked and killed all those people. It was a human, in essence, a serial killer. Then there are theories that somehow combine humans and animals in the explanation. For example, maybe some attacks were by humans and some were by animals. Or maybe there were serial killer humans using trained animals to attack people. Or, strangest of all, maybe the attacks were by a werewolf. And there were people at the time who referred to it in French as a werewolf. Then there are animal-based theories. It could have been an undiscovered animal, meaning one not known to science, that was responsible for the attacks. It could have been an animal that is known to science, but that is now extinct, that could have caused them. It could have been a mutant animal, meaning a specimen of a known animal that had an unusual genetic mutation. It could have been a large animal like a bear. It could have been a hyena. It could have been a large wolf. And it could have been something else. But what that something else might be, I'll hold back for the moment. Then let's look at these theories from the reason perspective. Could a human, a serial killer, have been responsible for the attacks? Despite the fact that some authors have proposed this, I see three problems with this theory. Uh, first, there were the two beasts that were killed, the wolf of Shaz and the Tenazer Canid. There were autopsies done on them, and they were definitely animals, not humans. However, it's possible that they were misidentified, and neither was really the beast of Javadon or that they were involved in some of the beast attacks, but they weren't responsible for all of them. Second, and I won't go into detail here, but humans just could not be responsible for some of the wounds that the victims received, at least not without using special equipment. Because the special thing about humans in combat is our brains. We're otherwise unremarkable predators. We don't have big claws, sharp teeth, or strong bites. But the injuries that the victim sustained would have required such claws, teeth, and bites, which a human could only have accomplished using serious tools. Third, and most fundamentally, the idea that a human was, was responsible just doesn't correspond to what the witnesses saw. They saw an animal perpetrating the attacks, including people who were in direct contact with the animal and even the victims who survived the attacks. But they didn't see a human. So I don't think the human serial killer theory is promising. What about the theories that try to merge humans and animals as an explanation? Well, the simplest of these is the hardest to rule out. It's possible that some of the attacks were by animals and some were by humans and people just got the two categories of attacks lumped together. However, if there had been one or more serial killers at work, you'd think that people would have reported that. So while I, in some of the attacks. So while I can't rule out this possibility altogether, I think that if humans were responsible for any of these attacks, it must have been a small number of them. Consequently, I think that we are looking for some kind of ferocious beast as the explanation in general for the attacks. When it comes to the idea of human serial killers using trained animals as their agents, I find this rather implausible. It would explain why we have reports of an animal attacking instead of a human attacking, but it also builds a new layer of complexity into the explanation in violation of Occam's razor. It also doesn't fit with the standard serial killer modus operandi. When you've got a human who wants to kill, he typically wants to do it himself. And while there may have been some, I can't think of any serial killers whose preferred method of operation was to train animals to kill on their behalf and then go out and take those animals into the open to hunt people at random. I thus can't completely rule this out, but I don't think it's likely. When it comes to werewolves, well, werewolves are cool. And we talked about them back in episode 90. But I don't think that anything really exists that turns from a human being into a wolf. I will note that some of the people at the time of the Beast of Gévaudan did actively talk 
about a werewolf being involved, or a lougarou in French. Literally, lou means wolf in French, and garou means werewolf. But words often have meanings other than their literal etymological definition would lead you to suggest would lead you to think. And Romero and Schwalb report. Richard Thompson says the French, translated as wolf werewolf, also simply implies a wolf that is anthropophagous, that is, a man eater. And this meaning was a familiar one at the time of the beast. So apparently the term Lugaru can also simply mean man-eating wolf, and the fact that some people perceived the beast of Gévaudan as a wolf may have led to some people calling it a Lugaru, since it obviously ate humans, and that in turn may have led other people to think of it as a werewolf. Then that brings us to the theories that the beast may have been an animal of some kind. If that's the case, why was it so aggressive toward humans? Aren't animals like wolves shy around humans? Don't they normally go after livestock like sheep rather than the shepherds guarding them? Yeah, they do. Uh, Wolves are notoriously reluctant to attack human beings, and with good reason, because we'll kick their butts. Attacking humans tends to end really badly for wolves. They will attack us, but only in two circumstances. The first is when they're starving and desperate for food. In that case, they will go after humans, but it's an act of desperation and something they do only as a last resort. The second circumstance is when they have rabies. In that case, they're out of their minds and will attack anything. Could that be it? Could the beast of Jevadon have been so aggressive toward humans because it had rabies? That's one of the first things that tends to occur to people when they start looking into this mystery. However, there are problems with the idea. The first problem is that rabid animals attack things indiscriminately. A rabid animal would not show a preference for humans. It would go after livestock and domestic animals like dogs just as much as it would go after humans. Rabid animals even attack inanimate objects like trees and stones. They are so crazy they'll just bite anything. The second problem is that they didn't have rabies treatments in the 1700s, and without swift treatment, rabies is 100% fatal. So the victims, the human victims, who survived the initial beast attacks should have come down with rabies themselves and then died. But they didn't. They went on to live regular normal lifespans. Third, Rabbit animals can't swallow effectively. That's why they develop foam around their mouths, because they can't swallow their own spit. But the beast of Gévaudan was attacking people for food. I won't go any further than that, but suffice it to say, this beast did not have a problem swallowing. Fourth, and most significantly, rabies is a short-term disease. After infection, symptoms take about three weeks to manifest, and then, once the animal becomes symptomatic, it dies in about a week. So, if the beast of Gévaudan was aggressive because it had rabies, its attacks would have only lasted about a week. Instead, they lasted for three years. So, I don't think we can explain the animal's aggressiveness by rabies. It looks like this animal was just naturally aggressive towards humans. Could the beast have been an undiscovered or extinct animal that was naturally aggressive to humans? An undiscovered large predator in Europe, even in the 1700s, is not likely. As we've talked about in other episodes about cryptids or hidden animals, it's not just a question of finding an individual member of a species. The species itself needs a breeding population in order to survive, and it's unlikely that you could have a species of large predators in Europe and yet not have it discovered. It's especially unlikely that it would not have been discovered in the last 250 years if it was madly aggressive towards European humans, as the beast of Gévaudan was. So I don't think the undiscovered theory is probable. When it comes to extinct predators, well, there did used to be such creatures in Europe, but they lived thousands of years ago and they died out, either because of changing environmental conditions or because our ancestors hunted them to extinction or outcompeted them. And to survive into the 1700s, well, you definitely need a breeding population. So 
the idea of a breeding population of an otherwise extinct predator that's very aggressive towards humans surviving for all that time, all those thousands of years, and remaining undiscovered isn't very likely. I thus think that we need to look towards animals that are known to exist in the present day for an explanation. What about the idea that the beast of Gévaudan was just a mutant? In that case, you wouldn't need a special breeding population for it. It could just be a lone animal that had a genetic mutation that made it unusually aggressive toward humans. Well, this is a possibility. Every organism has genetic mutations. In fact, we acquire them over the courses of our lives. And it's certainly possible that the beast might have had one or more mutations that made it unusually aggressive towards humans. However, there's no way to prove this at this late date because we have no way of DNA testing the beast to look for mutations. Also, even if we could, the creature had to be a mutation of something. There had to be a base animal species to have the mutation. And we have a much better chance of identifying what that base species was. Then let's talk about what species the beast may have belonged to. Bears are large and can seriously harm humans. Could it have been a bear? Well, they do have bears in Europe. Uh, specifically, they have the Eurasian brown bear, also known as the European brown bear. And bears can be dangerous to humans. However, the Eurasian brown bear's range, at least today, tends to be further east and further north in Europe. Uh, there may have been some in France, and there could have easily been more back in the 1700s, but I see three problems with this theory. First, the brown bear had been driven to extinction in this part of France where the beast was attacking, though it's possible that a brown bear had traveled from elsewhere in Europe. Second, people knew what bears were, so you'd think that the witness descriptions would have suggested a bear, if that's what the beast was. Third, and most significant, one of the consistent traits that people reported who saw the beast was that it had a long tail. And that rules out bears, because bears, including the Eurasian brown bear, famously have short, stubby tails. So the witness descriptions do not fit the bear theory. What about the idea that the beast may have been a hyena? There were even pictures made of the beast at the time that identified it as a hyena. Hyenas are an interesting choice. Uh, hyenas are carnivores, and they're technically classified as feliform, meaning that they are cat-like. However, they also look kind of dog-like, and so they're really more closely related to cats, but many people think of them like dogs. Hyenas are not native to Europe, but as we saw in episode 284 on the questing beast of Arthurian legend, there has been a historic trade in exotic animals from other parts of the world, particularly for royal menageries or zoos, as well as for fairs and carnivals that put on public shows. And so animals got taken to Europe from exotic locations, and sometimes they may have escaped. So maybe someone brought a hyena to Europe, and then it got loose and started killing people. That's certainly possible. The question would be how well a hyena fits the description given of the beast. And there's one breed of hyena that fits relatively well. It's known as the striped hyena. It's big. They can get up to 5 feet 7 inches long with their tail, and they can weigh up to 120 pounds. They do have a long tail, though it's a bushy one. Um, Striped hyenas have a yellowish color that can be described as red, and it has some dark stripes on its body and a dark stripe on its back. It has a notable snout. Uh, the front legs of the body are higher than the back legs, which fits with some witnesses' descriptions of the beast's front body being larger than its hindquarters. And most significantly, it kind of sort of looks like a wolf. And many people who saw the beast said it was like a wolf, but not a wolf. So all that fits the beast. On the other hand, the fact that hyenas' front legs are longer than their rear legs makes them poor jumpers. And the beast of Gévaudan was reportedly extremely good at jumping. It's reported that the beast could presumably with a running start, jump 28 feet horizontally. 
and it was reportedly able to leap over a hedge that was 18 feet tall. Now, to my mind, those are likely exaggerations, but they suggest that the be beast was really good at leaping, which striped hyenas are not. Another quite serious problem for the hyena thesis is the temperament that striped hyenas have. Romero and Schwalb report, Striped hyenas rarely attack livestock or people and are unaggressive, even allowing dogs to attack them without attempting to defend themselves. If cornered by dogs, they may choose flight rather than a fight. And if unable to get away, they may foil dogs by playing dead. Then with their attackers off guard, they're likely to jump to their feet and bound away to safety. So that's the exact opposite of the way the beast was reported to act. It was aggressive, not unaggressive. Hyenas will even let themselves be attacked by dogs and maybe play dead rather than fight back. Now, there have been a few attacks by hyenas on people, but they're rare. And they tend to be attacks on children who are sleeping outdoors at night and thus aren't defending themselves not people who are active during the daytime when the beast was known to attack. Also, as their name suggests, striped hyenas have prominent stripes on their sides, but the beast wasn't reported to have prominent stripes on its side, though some reports did say that it had some spots on its side. And then there's the fact that the striped hyena is nocturnal, but the beast was active during the day. Consequently, the hyena hypothesis is interesting, but it's not a great fit. What did the autopsies of the wolf of Shas and the Tenazir canid show? Unfortunately, we no longer have the bodies or tissue samples from the creatures, so we can't DNA test them. However, we do have the written autopsies of the creatures, and they're quite useful. In the case of the wolf of Shas, uh, we also have multiple eyewitness statements from people who saw it after it was killed, and they're all in agreement that it was a wolf. A somewhat big wolf, but a wolf. Now, it's possible that the wolf of Shaz uh, could have been responsible for some of the attacks attributed to the beast of Gévaudan, but it could not have been responsible for all of them because they started up against two months after it was killed. And then what about the autopsy on the other beast, the Tenazir canid? Well, uh, it also appears to have been a canid, a dog-like creature. However, it does not appear to have been a normal wolf. Romero and Schwalb report. To some international researchers, including Phil Barnson, and taking into account the measurements reported, morphological aspects, color spots, chest mark, leg appearances, etc., and the dental formula corresponding with that of a canid, 42 teeth, as in wolves, dogs, coyotes, etc. The beast shot by Jean Chastel was probably a wild dog. If we assume that this theory is right, we could ask ourselves, a dog, but what kind? And what about its unusual appearance, which confused hunters and others familiar with wolves and wild carnivores? The answer could lie in the middle, and Chastel's Tenazaire canid could represent some kind of mixture a creature with both wolf and dog characteristics, a hybrid, hence its odd morphology. Such specimens may result from habitat fragmentation, more common in Europe, low population densities, or when feral dogs encounter solitary wolves living apart from a pack. Female and male wolves, and also coyotes, usually become reproductively active once a year in the springtime. Female dogs, on the other hand, are reproductively active two times a year, approximately each six to eight months for around 20 days. Thus, a female dog can mate with a wolf or coyote only during the female's limited breeding period, but a male dog encountering a female wolf or coyote in estrus is prepared to mate any time. Therefore, it is much more probable that if the Latenazaire canid was a wolf-dog hybrid, its father was a dog mated with a female wolf. A bigger chance for the pairing and therefore mating to happen, the male dog is ready to mate all year round. The animal shows clear characteristics associated with wolf-dog hybrids, canids very similar to a wolf in general appearance and size, but which retain certain dog features not present in purebred wolves. We can therefore conclude that some of these characteristics confused hunters and experts alike. Thus, the attribution to the beast of an unknown identity 
or unclassifiable morphology. I just don't see a problem with thinking of the Tenazer canid as a wolf-dog hybrid. Uh, that seems plausible. But there's still a problem to be solved because neither wolves nor dogs, including wild dogs, are known to prey specifically on humans. Now, it's obvious that the beast must have preyed on other things besides humans, like during the two months after the wolf of Shaz had been killed but no beast attacks occurred, the beast must have been eating something else, either livestock or wild creatures in the forest. But the beast displayed really unusually predatory behavior towards humans, and neither wolves nor dogs are known for that. Wolves are positively shy around humans. For reasons we discussed, it doesn't tend to end well for them when they attack us. And except for rabies, which the beast didn't have, they do it only when they're desperate. And they prefer going after our livestock to going after us. Yet the beast would ignore the sheep that the people of France were herding and go straight for the shepherds. Dogs also don't typically prey on humans. They're not scared of us the way wolves are. Dogs and humans have been living alongside each other cooperatively for tens of thousands of years since the Ice Age. Dogs are probably the first animal we domesticated. According to recent estimates, humans and dogs have been living and working together for between 20 and 30,000 years. Romero and Schwalb proposed that this might be why the beast attacked humans, because as a wolf-dog hybrid, it didn't have wolves' native fear of humans. But the whole thing about domesticating dogs is that for tens of thousands of years, they've been bred to be friendly to us. In fact, we've bred them so that they continue to display friendly juvenile characteristics into adulthood. Now, yes, there are dogs, particularly ones raised in the wild, that bark a lot and may try to bite humans, but the idea of them preferring to prey on humans over livestock doesn't make sense to me. What about the fact that the beast attack stopped after the Tenazir canid was killed? Wouldn't that indicate that it, it was the beast of Javadin? It's certainly reasonable to take it that way, and it does provide evidence that would support the Tenazir canid as being the beast. But that evidence isn't conclusive. We already know that more than one animal was involved in this overall situation, including the wolf of Shaz. And it's quite possible, and I think likely, that there were multiple animals involved. You know, any time anyone got attacked in this period, they'd blame it on the beast. But there needed to be at least one central beast that was really aggressive and that was responsible for the bulk of the attacks. It's just hard for me to imagine that this was a wolf-dog hybrid that preferentially went after humans rather than attacking sheep. Then how would you explain the attack stopping? There are, there are some possibilities, and they're explored by Karl Hans Take in his short book, The Gévaudan Tragedy. Take is of the opinion that the actual beast was not a wolf, a dog, or a wolf-dog hybrid. But concerning the death of the Tenazer canid, he writes, The last attack is dated 17 June 1767. Two days later, Jean Chastel killed the wolf in the forest of Tenazer. Then this series of attacks stopped. Can there be such a coincidence? Two days after the last reliably documented attack, a wolf is shot dead, which cannot have been the beast. But nevertheless, the perennial series of horrors now comes to an end? First, it should be noted that the alleged death of the beast was not a unique event. Since the appearance of the beast, very many wolves were killed in Gévaudan, and several of these were suspected to have been the beast. If there had been no more attacks after the most recent killing of a wolf, then this would have been viewed as proof that the respective wolf was the beast. But should the beast now have died nearly exactly on that day when once again, with much fanfare, the killing of any old wolf was celebrated as the death of the beast? That cannot be ruled out, but it is improbable. What is more probable is that the beast either had already been dead for some time when Chastel shot the wolf, or that it survived after that. For the first possibility, it can be said that Jean Bastide, killed two days before the death of the wolf, probably did not become a victim of the beast. The parish priest Molerat 
noted down on the occasion of her burial, devoured by a man-eating wolf. Whether Molarat's entry reflected the reality is another question. However, it is inadmissible to assume an attack of the beast when the attacker is referred to as a wolf in the parish register. The last sign of the beast, therefore, was the death of nine-year-old Catherine Chotard on 12 June in Couffour. The beast seemed to have disappeared from the scene before the middle of June. In spring 1767, for months an extensive poisoning action was performed. Thus, still in June 1767, poisoned baits were lying in the home range of the beast. It is conceivable that the beast ate from poisoned bait and withdrew, dying into a rocky shelter, inaccessible for humans, or into a swamp area. But it is also conceivable that the beast still lived after 19 June. Time and again it went into hiding for longer periods, did not attack humans during that time, and ate exclusively animals. And thirdly, it cannot be excluded that the beast still attacked people, but was no longer mentioned as the attacker because it was considered to be dead. So the fact that the reported deaths ended around the time the Tenazir Canid was killed doesn't prove that it was the primary actor in the beast attacks. Do we have any evidence that the beast of Gévaudan was something else? I think we have evidence that's worth considering. Uh, you'll recall that I said that there was another possible kind of animal that might have been responsible for the attacks. And so now we're going to get into that. We'll start by noting some of the characteristics of the beast, both in terms of its behavior and in terms of how it was described by eyewitnesses. One of the ways of checking whether the beast might be a wolf or similar animal is by looking at when it attacked, because wolf attacks are more common in some months than in others. And here we're not considering attacks by rabid wolves because those can happen anytime. We're considering the natural predatory cycle of non-rabid wolves with respect to humans. Take provides a chart comparing the months when non-rabid wolf attacks tend to happen with when the beast attacks happen. And it's clear that desperate wolves attack in the summer. There is a huge spike beginning in May and ending in September, with a quarter of the whole year's attacks coming in the month of July alone. But the beast's attack pattern is very different. It's got two peak seasons for attacks. One is between March and May, and the other one is in September and October. In the summer is when it's less aggressive, and July, the most active month for wolf attacks, is the least active for beast attacks. This would suggest that the beast was not a wolf, but something else. Another way of checking whether the beast was a wolf or some other kind of canid is by comparing the data of the beast attacks with the known statistics of non-rabid wolf attacks and seeing if they match. Take does a really good job in his short book of evaluating statistics, so I want to give him credit for that. And the statistics do give us reason to question the idea that the beast was a wolf or another canid. For example, Take compares the ages of the human victims of non-rabid wolf attacks with the ages of the victims of the beast. He divides the victims up into three age groups. Those people who were up to nine years old, those who were between 10 and 18 years old, and those who were over 18 years old. Roughly speaking, that's children, teenagers, and adults, which is how I'll refer to them. When wolves are driven to attack humans, 60% of the victims tend to be children, 36% of the victims are teenagers, and only 4% are adults. We thus see wolf attacks following a line sloping downward. The bigger the human is, the less the wolf wants to attack it. But when you look at the ages of the people attacked by the beast, only 20% of them were children, not 60. About 54% were teenagers, and about 26% were adults. So instead of a smoothly falling line, the ages of the beast's victims form a bell curve or normal distribution with a few children, a lot of teenagers, and, a, and few adults. 
The Beast wasn't nearly as interested in children as Desperate Wolves were. It was more interested in teenagers and even adults. Does that suggest anything about what the Beast may have been? One thing it suggests is that the Beast had different dietary needs. Uh, Not to be indelicate, but the bigger a Beast is, the more food it needs. Consequently, larger carnivores might not be that interested in small children because there's not much meat on them. So they may be in more, more inclined to go for teenagers, but somewhat less inclined to go for adults who are better at defending themselves. So from the statistical data, it looks like the beast may have been something other than a wolf. It looks like it may have been a larger carnivore that needed larger prey. Why would a larger carnivore go after teenagers who could defend themselves, for example, with the lances we heard about, rather than livestock like sheep? One reason is that sheep tend to be smaller. Uh, They also can be covered with thick wool, which could make it hard to get at their organs, which is the part of the prey that predators go for first. But I can think of another possibility. The beast simply may not have been familiar with sheep. Predators learn how to hunt prey animals that are around them in their natural environment. But if they've been dislocated to another environment, they may not know how to hunt the local prey that just look strange and weird to them. So I think it's possible that the animal was dislocated from another part of the world, perhaps an escapee from a menagerie or a traveling carnival. And so it knew about humans because they were the ones who dislocated it and ran the menagerie or carnival. But it didn't know how to hunt sheep and goats. Humans were the right size, and it may have attacked and eaten humans before, so it may have been comfortable hunting humans. This may be why the beasts seem to prefer attacking humans to attacking easier animals. It just wasn't familiar with them. This also may be why the beast's uh, predation patterns shifted over time, because it got better at hunting the local prey enabling it to do things like have that two-month break from attacking humans after the wolf of Shaz was killed. Another thing to note about the beast is that it seems to have been a solitary animal. It only attacked people itself, not with others of its kind. And that's different than common wolf behavior. Uh, Wolves are pack animals and pack hunters, though there are solitary wolves, so that's not conclusive. How did eyewitnesses describe the beast? It varied from one witness to another, which is not surprising. Uh, That may be because more than one animal was involved and people lumped them together. But when it comes to the main super aggressive predator, one witness described it this way, according to Take. The victim of the attack described the animal to be as big as a cow with dense hair and long claws. The animal had a very wide chest, a big head, short upright ears and a long snout. The tail was long and strangely thin. From the upper side of the head to the tip of the tail ran a dark stripe. That thin tail is something that would distinguish it from the spotted hyena because spotted hyena have bushy tails. It's possible that a spotted hyena could have mange or be in poor health and all its tail hairs fell out. So that's not conclusive, but it is suggestive that it wasn't a spotted hyena, especially given the timidity of the animal that we discussed earlier. Also note the other characteristics. Large as a cow, dense hair, long claws, something that wolves and canids in general don't have. A wide chest, a big head with short upright ears and a long snout, and a long dark stripe down its back. Now here's a summary description by Captain Jean-Baptiste Boulanger du Hamel. This animal has the size of a one-year-old bull. Its paws are as strong as those of a bear, with six claws each that are as long as fingers. The mouth is extraordinarily big. The chest is as strong as that of a horse. The body is as long as that of a leopard. The tail is as thick as an arm and at least four feet long. The hair on its head is blackish. The eyes are as big as those of a calf and they sparkle. The ears are as short as those of a wolf and are upright. The fur on the belly is whitish. The fur of the body is red with a black stripe with the width of four fingers from the neck to the base of the tail. This animal is a monster whose father is a lion. 
It remains open what the mother is. Of note here is that the beast's paws are said to be as strong as a bear's, and that is definitely not true of wolves. It's also said that it has claws that are as long as a finger. That's also definitely not true of wolves. They have super short claws. The body is as long as a leopard, but it's apparently not a leopard, since Duhamel knew what leopards are and distinguished this beast from one. It has reddish fur on its body with a long dark stripe down its back, and he says that its father is a lion, but he doesn't know what its mother was. Notice that big cat connection, and it's not the only one. You'll recall that other people thought that the beast was a hyena, and hyenas are feliform animals that are more closely related to cats than dogs. Others also interpreted the beast in terms of a big cat. For example, Etienne Lafont, a government official, said this. An alien animal that is said to be a leopard the size of a one-year-old bovine animal with a thick head, pointed muzzle, and elongated body that tapers toward the rear, the chest very wide, its fur is reddish-brown with a nearly black stripe on the back from head to tail. The fur on the chest is gray-white. So Lafont also regarded it as a big cat, in his case a leopard, though Duhamel distinguished it from a leopard. Another man, uh, J. Bourgeois, who was a parson, wrote in what he thought it was based on the descriptions he'd read. Dear sirs, the fierce beast that ravaged the Gévaudon seems, according to the description that was made in the newspapers and gazettes, to be a tiger cat a strange animal, and I think we cannot find anywhere but in the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico, where there are many. The big cat predator from the Yucatan would be a jaguar, so we're seeing a number of sources interpreting the beast as a big cat. A jaguar, in the case of Parshan Bourgeois, a leopard, in the case of Monsieur Lafont, and something part lion, in the case of Captain Duhamel. With that in mind, let's go back to Take's book. He thinks that the beast was a lion, and he says, The description of size, appearance, behavior, strength, it all fits together. The comparison of size with a one-year-old bovine animal and a donkey. Flat head, reddish fur, a dark line along the spine occasionally occurring in lions. Spots on the side of the body that appear especially in young lions a tail which appears to be strangely thin since short-haired, a tassel on the tail, enormous strength that allowed the animal to carry off adult humans and to split human skulls as well as to jump 9 meters or 29 feet, roaring calls described as terrible barking or as dull sounds like from a dog that tries to bark, a paw print of 16 centimeters length or 6 inches, using claws during an attack, throttling victims, that is, killing by interrupting the airflow at the throat, a preference for the open country. All of those things were reported by witnesses about the beast, and they all fit lions. Okay, let me give you some pushback. <laughs> lions are one of the most famous animals in the world. Even people who've never seen one with their own eyes have seen pictures of lions with their long, distinctive, famous manes. Yet multiple witnesses of the beast described it as like a wolf, but not a wolf. If it was really a lion, why didn't anybody identify it as a lion? Why did Duhamel say only that its father was a lion, but its mother was unknown? As to why nobody identified it as a lion, I think the main reason is that it simply didn't have a mane. And without that distinctive feature, people thought it must be something else. They noted its lion-like characteristics, but they didn't draw the conclusion it was a lion because it didn't have a famous mane. And why wouldn't it have a mane? There could be several reasons. Uh, first, it could have been a female, because females don't have manes. However, when Madame Jeanne Jouvet was trying to save her son, she reportedly grabbed it by its genitals, which would mean that it was male, because you couldn't do that with a female lion. Second, the lion could have been in ill health that caused its mane to fall out. For example, when lions have low testosterone, their manes can fall out. Third, it could have been in captivity. 
Uh, Being in captivity means lions don't have to fight or hunt as much, so their testosterone level drops and some captive lions lose their manes. Fourth, the lion could have been old because lions' manes deteriorate after they reach seven years old. Fifth, it could have been young because manes with male lions are like beards with human men. In fact, manes are basically lion beards. They don't begin growing until on lions until they're about a year old and they get longer with age. A lion may not have a fully grown mane until they're like three years old. And sixth, some lions, some male lions, just don't have manes. So Take explains what he thinks happened. The beast had, at least in its first year at Gévaudan, on the back of its head and neck, a tuft of upright hair, which we may imagine as a mohawk a haircut. Subadult male lions have such a tuft. This means males in the transitional phase to their adult life. When the beast reached Gévaudan in 1764, it was hardly older than two or three years and not at the zenith of its physical development. To chase a mature, fight-experienced older male away from its human victim with the use of lances would rarely have been successful. But the beast was sometimes chased away from its victim by people with lances. The beast died in 1767, obviously at an age when males do not yet wear a gorgeous mane. But also old males by no means always have a mane. In some African regions, maneless males are even more abundant than those with a mane. In the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago, three mounted male lions are displayed, which are notorious as man-eaters, namely the two Savo man-eaters and the man-eater of Mifue. All three are maneless. It was this that helped something fall into place for me. After reading about the Savo man-eaters and the man-eater of Mifue, who were active in Kenya and Zambia, I looked them up online. The man-eater of Mfue looks rather like a lion, almost like a female lion because it's maneless, but the bone structure of its head is like that of a male. But when I saw the Tutsavo man-eaters, wow, I really saw how they could be described as looking kind of like a wolf, but not a wolf. Um, We'll put a picture of them in the video version of the podcast, and we'll have a link to their Wikipedia page in the show notes. And yes, you can see, if you study them, you can see, yeah, they're cats and not dogs. But without their manes, I could really see how you could interpret them, especially if you saw them from a distance or only briefly and with plants and stuff around them, as thinking they're like wolves, but not the same as wolves. There's also one other thing that I think supports the lion hypothesis. I've avoided saying it until now, and I'm going to say it as delicately as possible, but the beast of Gévaudan repeatedly decapitated its victims multiple times. It took off their heads and carried some of them away, once even biting a human skull in two. That's much more characteristic of what a lion could do than what a wolf could would be likely to do. So I think that also supports the lion hypothesis. I thus think that a maneless lion, especially a young one, fits a lot of the data and could be a good candidate for the main beast of Gévaudan. Although other animals, including wolves like the wolf of Chaz and the apparent wolf-dog hybrid of Tenezaire, were also involved. What about other big cats? What about the beast being a tiger? They have even redder fur than lions do. That's true, they do. Um, But yellowish-brown fur colors often get described as red. It doesn't have to be as orangey as a tiger's fur. And lions do have fur in the range that some people would call red. In fact, there are a lot of businesses in various places in the world called called Red Lion. Also, a tiger would be more identifiable by its stripes, which is their most prominent characteristic. So you would think that the beast would have been identified on that basis if it was a tiger, or at least that we'd have reports of it being covered in stripes all over its body. 
Instead of stripes, the beast was sometimes reported to have spots on its sides, and those are characteristics of young lions rather than tigers. Also, tigers don't have tufts on the ends of their tails the way the beast and that lions do. Instead, tigers have untufted tails that are covered by rings, and nobody seems to have reported that about the beast. Finally, the beast had a long dark stripe down the middle of its back, and tigers don't really have those, but lions can. So although I gave a lot of thought to tigers uh, based on the more reddish color of their fur, I think a lion would be the better candidate in light of what witnesses reported. And what can we say about the beast of Gévaudan from the faith perspective? Well, it appears to have been just an animal, not a supernatural wonder, so there's not a lot to say from the faith perspective. However, as Pope Benedict XVI pointed out, and as we pointed out in episode 208 on time travel prayer, it's never too late to pray for someone. So we can all still pray for the victims of the Beast of Gévaudan and all others who are attacked in ways like they were. So Jimmy, what's your bottom line on this mystery? The Beast of Gévaudan is a fascinating mystery, and the events would have been terrifying to those who lived through them. I think that there were actually several animals involved in these events. Two were the Wolf of Shaz and the Tenazer Canid, who were respectively a wolf and likely a wolf-dog hybrid. There may have been other animals, including other wolves involved too, but I think that there was likely a single super aggressive predator that was the main beast. And I think there's a quite good possibility that this beast was a dislocated, maneless lion. So Jimmy, what further resources can we offer to the listeners and viewers? We'll have links to Romero and Schwalb's book, Beast, Werewolves, Serial Killers, and Man-Eaters, The Mystery of the Monsters of Gévaudan. Also, Carl Hans Take's book, The Gévaudan Tragedy, A Disastrous Campaign of a Deported Beast. We'll also have links to uh, a paper on the fear of wolves, which involves a review of wolf attacks on humans. Also links to information and pictures of the Savo man-eaters and the man-eater of Mfue. And now it's time to hear from you. What are your theories about the Beast of Gévaudan? Let us know by visiting the uh, our website at sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page, sending us an email to feedback at mysterious.fm, sending a tweet to at mys underscore world, visiting the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord, or calling our mysterious feedback line at 619-738-4515. That's 619-738-4515. And I want to say a special word of thanks to Oasis Studio 7 for the video and animation work on this episode. You can see what they do by going to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. And while you're there, I'm trying to grow my channel, and you can help, number number one, by subscribing, because I'm, at the time of recording, I'm almost to 50,000 subscribers, and you can help us get there. Also, be sure, when you subscribe, to hit the bell notification, so you always get notified when I have a new video out. I usually have multiple videos per week now. And you can help us by liking and commenting on the show because that will tell the YouTube algorithm you found this episode engaging so other people might find it engaging too and it'll show it to more people so you can help the show grow just by liking commenting and subscribing Jimmy what's our next episode going to be about well researching and writing this week's episode on the beast of Gévaudan was quite intense for me it forced me to read and think about way more unpleasant stuff than what I shared with you in the episode so After that, I wanted a palate cleanser. I wanted to do something fun and happy with animals on the show. So next week, we're going to be talking about our lovable, cuddly pets and the mysteries connected with them. Specifically, we're going to be talking about whether your faithful dog or fluffy cat can actually 
read your mind. And believe it or not, we'll be looking at actual scientific experiments to test whether that really happens. So you won't want to miss the mystery of pet telepathy. Excellent. Folks, be sure to follow Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, TuneIn, your favorite podcast app, or at Jimmy's YouTube channel, where you should make sure to hit the bell to get notifications. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion on our show notes at mysterious.fm slash 297. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you by Great Lakes Customs Law, helping importers and individuals with seizures, penalties, and compliance with U.S. Customs Matters throughout the United States. Visit GreatLakesCustomsLaw.com. And by Rosary Army, featuring award-winning Catholic podcasts, rosary resources, videos, and the School of Mary online community, prayer, and learning platform. Learn how to make them, pray them, and give them away while growing in your faith at rosaryarmy.com and schoolofmary.com. And by Tim Shevlin's personal fitness training for Catholics, providing spiritual and physical wellness programs and daily accountability check-ins. Strengthen yourself to help further God's kingdom. Work out for the right reason with the right mindset. Learn more by visiting fitcatholics.com. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Tom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest.